Moreover, we should remove the obstacle of considering others' suffering unrelated to oneself and lacking the willingness to strive to eliminate their suffering. We have addressed one obstacle earlier, but there is another one. We may feel that the suffering of others is none of our business, so there is no need to strive to relieve their suffering. This is the second obstacle to the practice of exchanging self and others. After addressing the first obstacle, the attachment to the difference between oneself and others, self and others become interchangeable and relative. The second obstacle is the belief that the suffering of others is unrelated to oneself. This misconception is due to the attachment of inherent existence, perceiving this as I and that as others. Therefore, one lacks the urgency and motivation to strive to relieve others' suffering. If we follow this logic, we should not accumulate wealth when we are young out of concern for the suffering we may experience when we are old, as the suffering experienced in old age does not harm our younger selves. If we think according to this logic, then we don't need to strive to earn money when we are young fearing that we may suffer when we are old. After all, the suffering we experience when we are old doesn't harm our younger selves, so why bother preparing for it in advance? We prepare for the future when we are young because we consider it an effort for ourselves. Thus, we willingly do so. If we realise that sentient beings and ourselves are inseparable and that helping them eliminate suffering is not for others but for ourselves, our motivation will be completely different. This explanation is clear. When we are young, we don't spend all the money we earn. Instead, we save part of it as a pension. At that time, we haven't become old, So why do we prepare for the suffering of old age? It's because you know you will grow old and experience the suffering of old age. If you recognise that sentient beings and ourselves are interconnected and inseparable, you will understand that the suffering of sentient beings also leads to our suffering. Thus, you will realize that if sentient beings don't attain Buddhahood, you too cannot attain Buddhahood. You are in the same boat as sentient beings. To reach the other shore, you must go together with them. You cannot go there alone. When you have this understanding, the insight of Mahayana Buddhism, this requires wisdom. You need to realise that self and others are inseparable. Helping sentient beings eliminate suffering is also helping oneself. At that point, the difference between self and others disappears. According to Mahayana Buddhism, self and others are not separate or absolute. They are just labels. After attaining a wisdom, you will realize that all Buddhas are essentially one with universal compassion. At that time, you will see that all sentient beings are yourself and are essentially one. At that point, the notion of I and the attachment to self disappear. You will find that all sentient beings are manifestations of our true nature. Thus, it is our duty to eliminate the suffering of all sentient beings. You won't perceive these aggregates as I and those aggregates as others because they are essentially one. You will treat everyone equally. Where does our suffering come from? Our suffering comes from sentient beings and our happiness also comes from sentient beings. We are a whole. Without wisdom, we cannot recognize this wholeness. Therefore, we need to learn wisdom. If we follow this logic, then the hand should not relieve the pain for the leg, because the leg is other. If we delve into this logic, when the leg is injured, the hand should not relieve the pain for the leg, 
because, from the perspective of the hand, the leg is also someone else. When your hand is not in pain but your leg is, your hand will help your leg. Perhaps someone may say it is because both the hand and the leg are mine. In reality, everything in the world is like our hands and legs, closely interconnected. This is because the world is interdependent. Nothing exists alone. The world is interdependent and we are all interconnected as one. All our suffering is related to sentient beings and all our happiness is also related to sentient beings. The suffering and happiness of sentient beings follow the same principle. We are all part of a whole. Just like our hands and legs, although they may seem unrelated, they are actually connected. We can provide a few more examples, such as the continuum in the morning and the continuum in the afternoon. Furthermore, let's analyse a few more examples. For instance, does the pain you experience in the afternoon affect you in the morning? If it doesn't, then in the morning you shouldn't prevent the pain in the afternoon. Or, in the afternoon, you shouldn't console the pain experienced in the morning. I believe no one would think like this or be concerned about such matters. This is analysed from the perspective of time. Although the continuum in the afternoon is no longer the same you, you still believe it is you and think about what you will experience in the afternoon. In reality, from the perspective of the I in the morning, the I in the afternoon is other rather than I. The I of tomorrow has no direct connection to the present I, so it should be called other. However, as ordinary beings, we tend to perceive it as our continuum or I. In reality, from the perspective of the present I, it is other. If you are not suffering now but will suffer tomorrow, it indicates that these two entities are not the same thing. How can the same thing be different? How can it not suffer today but suffer tomorrow? We tend to believe that our older self and younger self share the same continuum, while hands and feet share the same aggregate, unlike self and other, which are two separate entities. We care about our older selves. Our hands and feet help each other. It is because we believe that our older selves are the continuation of our younger selves. Our hands and feet grow on the same body, unlike self and other, which are two separate entities. For example, my continuum won't extend to your life, and your continuum won't extend to my life. We perceive this body, the hands and feet as mine because we lock them in with self-attachment. As a result, we consider everything outside of this system as other. However, once we delete this setting, we will realise that the so-called you, I and they, as well as humans and animals, are all essentially one. We confine ourselves to our attachments. Consequently, we fall into such a state. However, locks can be opened and attachments can be released. Upon releasing the attachments, you will discover that the entire Dharma realm is a whole. We and other sentient beings are interconnected and inseparable, just like the relationship between hands and feet. We know the concept of the food chain. As humans, we rely on various microorganisms in our bodies to survive. Without them, we would quickly die. So, aren't we closely connected to other sentient beings? Without microorganisms, not to mention animals, even plants would not be able to grow. What would we eat then? Therefore, all sentient beings are interconnected. This is an extended discussion. 
Humans tend to be attached to their families, perceiving them as mine. They love and protect their family members. They feel intimately connected to their family members. Hence, they are attached to them. They are willing to dedicate themselves to their family members, treating them as they would treat themselves, because they consider it as my family. If you remove this my, you won't think in the same way. For example, if you think, this is my village, you will protect people from your clan. If you continue to expand your mind, you will think, this is my country. Furthermore, when aliens come, you will think, this is my planet. This demonstrates that our minds can continuously expand. If aliens were to invade Earth, people on Earth would immediately unite and fight against aliens. This demonstrates that the scope of I can continuously expand. Continuum and aggregation are merely established based on multiple moments and aggregates. They are not independent entities. Whether it is the continuum from youth to old age, or the aggregation of hands and feet in the body, they all arise from various causes and conditions. In other words, life is composed of numerous moments and aggregates. One is in terms of time, and the other is in terms of space. Life is composed of numerous moments and aggregates. Based on them, we establish the notions of self and other. However, there is no dominant, independent and unchanging entity. When it comes to removing the obstacles to exchanging self and others, we need to uproot self-attachment. Because if there is an attachment to I, it is hard to exchange oneself and others. Therefore, as I mentioned before, the prerequisite for practicing exchanging self and others is to have the wisdom of non-self. With the insight of non-self, one can exchange oneself and others effortlessly. Based on them, we establish the notions of self and other. However, there is no dominant, independent and unchanging entity. Being dominant, independent and unchanging is what is meant by self. The Diamond Sutra states, If the world truly exists, it is a composite. The Tathagata teaches that the composite is not a real composite. It is merely called a composite. This is the essence of life, particles and the universe. All things are merely the continuum and aggregation of causes and conditions, like the flowing water, momentary and continuous. All things may appear to have a solid existence, but in reality they are all products of causes and conditions. The notions of self and others are also established based on continuity and aggregation. Self and other are relative and do not have an inherent nature. The notions of self and others are established based on continuity and aggregation. Continuity means a series of similar items, while aggregation refers to the combination of causes and conditions. These notions are established based on time and space. The difference between self and other exists only at the conventional level. There is no inherent independent nature. In essence, our aggregation is the same as the aggregation of other sentient beings. Clinging to these aggregates and firmly believing in their inherent existence as me or other is merely a delusion. Through such contemplation, you will realize that the so-called self is like a car. Apart from the aggregation of numerous parts, there is no car with an inherent unchanging nature. This is also about dealing with the attachment to self. Even so, 
due to the ingrained habits and attachments since beginningless time. When we experience suffering ourselves, we find it hard to bear. Hence, if we love others, we will also empathize with their suffering. Life is the continuum of moments and the aggregation of components. However, due to our ingrained habits and attachments since beginningless time, when we experience suffering ourselves, we instinctively find it hard to bear. If we extend this loving concern to other sentient beings, we will also empathize with their suffering and feel compassion for them. The principle is the same. Because we are attached to ourselves, we find it hard to endure our suffering. If we also care for others, we will empathize with their suffering as well. A mother's love for her children is like this. Every bit of suffering her children experience will cause the mother to worry and even feel immense suffering. Some mothers may collapse or even die on the spot upon hearing upon the death or immense suffering of their children. They are devastated. Why does the suffering of others make them suffer so much? It is because they perceive their children as mine. They consider their children to be a part of themselves. This is because we have been cultivating this kind of empathy since beginningless time. The strongest and most lasting love in human nature is maternal love. However, after reincarnation, it may change. Yesterday, we shared a story. In a past life, A was B's mother. Yet, in this lifetime, A becomes B's romantic rival. They have forgotten that they were mother and child in their past life. Due to their strong attachment to each other in their past life, they become romantic rivals in this lifetime. When faced with someone you are not attached to, you might think, they have nothing to do with me, they are someone else. However, once you perceive someone as your child or your mother, your mind will immediately change. This demonstrates that we are all products of causes and conditions and are subject to change. Therefore, the care and attachment to oneself are cultivated throughout countless lifetimes, but not inherently present. In the above teachings, we have addressed two common obstacles to practicing exchanging self and others, the belief that the happiness and suffering of oneself and others are experienced by different entities, and the belief that others' suffering is unrelated to oneself. The remedy for these obstacles is to realize that self and other don't exist independently. Only after overcoming these two mental obstacles can one formally practice exchanging self and others. Without realizing that self and other are mere labels, it may be difficult to engage in this practice willingly. If you haven't mentally accepted it, it will be difficult for you to practice it. If you perceive yourself and others as separate individuals, how can you exchange yourself and others? You won't be able to or be willing to practice it. If you haven't thoroughly understood the principles behind this practice, it will be hard for you to practice it. Therefore, it requires wisdom. As I mentioned before, to practice exchanging self and others, we need to eliminate self-attachment. It is essential to be free from the notion of self and other and realize that the five aggregates are illusory combinations. We can change this attachment at any time. If you don't cling to the notion of self and don't consider the five aggregates as I, your mind will expand. You can extend your mind toward all sentient beings and treat them equally. Our mind is boundless. It can be as vast as we want it to be. 
you can extend your mind toward all sentient beings and treat every being as yourself. Previously, you only loved yourself. Now, you can love all sentient beings without any problem. The mind can transform. After removing the obstacles, you can begin the practice. When practicing the exchange of self and others, we shouldn't be attached to our own happiness. Whatever we do, we aim to eliminate the suffering of sentient beings and benefit them. In reality, our suffering and happiness are not separate from one another. The first obstacle is the belief that our suffering has no connection to others and that others' happiness has no connection to us, perceiving our suffering and happiness as independent from others. Now, we have addressed this attachment and obstacle. We understand that our suffering and happiness are related to others, but not independent. Therefore, we cannot consider our suffering unrelated to others. Once we remove the first obstacle, we will realize that everyone's suffering and happiness are not separate from one another. The second obstacle is the belief that oneself and others are independent entities. In reality, self and others don't have an inherent independent existence. Instead, none of us has an intrinsic nature. From this perspective, it is easy to practice the exchange of self and others because others' suffering is also your suffering. By attaching yourself to others, they become you. You can regard anyone as yourself at any time. The support of wisdom makes it easier to practice the exchange of self and others. Wisdom is very important. Without the wisdom to realize this, it is hard to engage in this practice.